Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about one dimension classification systems for motor skills. Um, so motor skills can be classified based on the characteristic of the skills. Um, so one dimension um, classification systems are ways that we can look at two extremes that are related to each other, like frigid and scorching. Those are two extremes that are related to temperature. And we can classify motor skills along a continuum with two characteristics that are on the extremes of either end of that continuum. Um, so we take a characteristic and divide it into two categories that represent the two extremes. And then there's a continuum so that um, so that motor skills can be classified anywhere along that continuum. So the skill doesn't have to fit into one extreme or the other, um, but it's a way that we can kind of organize those motor skills and classify them according to that one characteristic. Um, so there are three particular classification systems that we commonly use. Um, the first is the size of the primary muscle groups that are required. So in that case, the extremes would be gross motor skills with large muscle groups and fine motor skills with small muscle groups, uh, where actions begin and end. So the two extremes would be continuous and discrete. And the stability of the environmental context, so the two extremes would be open motor skills and closed motor skills. So I'm going to go into each of those in a little bit more detail. <clears throat> Okay, so the continuum where gross motor skills and fine motor skills are on the two extremes. Um, gross motor skills use large musculature uh, and require less precision. So most of our fundamental movement patterns like walking, throwing, jumping, and so on are classified as gross motor skills. Fine motor skills use small musculature um, and require very much control and precision, uh, a lot of hand-eye coordination, precision and hand and finger movement. Um, so that could be like drawing, fastening buttons, typing, playing musical instruments. Um, now, some fine motor skills involve larger musculature, but those larger muscles are not necessary to achieve the goal of the skill. And in that case, it would still be classified as a fine motor skill. So think about like, writing. So using a pen or something and writing. Um, now that's a fine motor skill because it requires great control and precision and use of small musculature for movement of the fingers and the hands. Now larger musculature is also involved because larger musculature is supporting the posture of the body and the posture of the arm as you're writing. Uh, but the difference is that um, we can write in any kind of different posture. We can move the body in all sorts of different ways and use entirely different musculature to support that posture. And it won't affect your ability to achieve the goal of the skill. Like you could be hanging by your feet upside down and write on a chalkboard, you know? So the use of, of your larger musculature is not critical to achieving the goal of the skill. There are some skills that are classified somewhere along the continuum that do require large musculature and small musculature and cannot be completed in another way. Um, like archery is a really good example. Um, it requires very precise control of hand and finger movement on the bowstring, but it also requires large musculature of the neck, shoulder, and back to be able to pull back on the bowstring and be able to accurately aim the arrow and then to be able to release. So archery requires gross motor skill and fine motor skill. Um, and so it'd be classified somewhere along the continuum, somewhere in the middle, um, because that's different than other fine motor skills because without the musculature of the shoulder and the back, you, it doesn't matter what you do with your fingers, you're not going to be able to achieve the goal of the action in archery. Um, now, this type of classification is used a lot in education settings because um, different gross and fine motor skills develop at different ages. So this type of classification is used a lot in developing growing children um, to be able to identify where they fall, um, you know, compared to the norm, that sort of thing. Um, it's also used a lot in rehabilitation settings. So um, you know, these tend to be used for skills that we learned already as kids. So we use them to assess learning in kids, but also relearning in people who have had injuries or accidents uh, or stroke or something like that, and they're rehabilitating, they need to relearn those skills. 
Um, now, as a generalization, this isn't always true and there's a lot of overlap, um, but physical therapists tend to work more to improve gross motor skills and occupational therapists tend to work more to improve fine motor skills. Now, again, there's a lot of overlap and that is absolutely not um, you know, strictly the case, but it, it, there's more of a tendency in those two professions. That's why both are important in rehabilitation. Um, so the next classification is related to where actions begin and end. So in this case, our two extremes are discrete and continuous motor skills. So discrete motor skills are skills that have a specific beginning and ending location in the context of the environment. Continuous motor skills um, can begin and end anywhere that the location is arbitrary. Um, so discrete motor skills usually involve a simple one movement kind of skill. Um, continuous usually contains repetitive movements to constitute a longer lasting skill. Um, so examples of discrete motor skills could be like flipping a light switch or hitting a piano key. So both are happening in a specific location and are very simple kind of one movement skills. Continuous motor skills would be like steering while driving, swimming, walking, et cetera, where we have you know, repetitive movements that are happening over a period of time and where we start and end is not important. A serial motor skill, also referred to as a sequential motor skill, is a skill that requires a series or sequence of discrete movements. Okay, so you know, if hitting one piano key is a discrete motor skill, while well, playing a whole piano piece would be considered a serial motor skill or a sequential motor skill because it requires um, many discrete movements, meaning like hitting piano keys. So many done in the proper order and rhythm and uh, with the correct timing and all of that, and you play a piano piece. So that would be a serial motor skill. Uh, so it includes repetitive movements like continuous skills, but they also have a specific beginning and ending location in the environment like discrete skills. So it's kind of somewhere in between. Um, now, this classification system is used more often in research than anywhere else, and it highlights a lot of interesting features of control strategies that are different between the two. Okay, our last category here is the stability of the environmental context. So here, environmental context is referring to the physical location where the skill is performed, and we always need to consider three specific factors. So the supporting surface, so that's the floor, um, or whatever it is that you're completing the skill on top of. So that could be a bed, depending on what the skill is. That could be a couch, that could be the ground. Um, it could be a grassy surface or a concrete or astroturf or a sandy beach. So depending on the supporting surface for the skill, it's gonna have usually a pretty big effect on performance. Um, the objects involved, so that could be like a ball or a car or a dog leash or whatever. So all sorts of objects. Um, and then the last is if there are other people or animals involved. So maybe you're walking a dog or maybe you're passing in basketball. So you have a teammate that you're passing to. In this context, stability refers to whether the environmental context features that we just discussed are stationary or in motion. Okay, so maybe you're just walking across the living room and that's the action. Uh, so you're getting from you know, the hallway to the kitchen through the living room or whatever it is. So if there is a dog in the room, if that dog is on the couch, sound asleep, not moving, then we would say that the environmental context is stable. Maybe the dog is running around like a little maniac all over the house and you have to avoid tripping or kicking or whatever, and you wanna avoid the, the dog, um, then in that context, it would be unstable or not stable because there's movement involved uh, in the environmental context. So on our two ends of our spectrum here would be open motor skills and closed motor skills. So open motor skills are also referred to as externally paced. Um, so the environmental context features are in motion, meaning they're not stable. And the performer has to time the movement in accordance with the things in the environment that are moving around. So that's what we mean by externally paced is the timing is related to what is happening external to the person. 
So like surfing a wave, stepping onto a moving escalator, these are things that we have to time based on what is moving within our environment. The other end of the extreme is closed motor skills, also called self-paced, because it's not dependent on the movement or what is happening around us. And we can execute the skill when we are ready. We can set the pacing uh, rather than that being determined by the external context. Um, so in this case, the environmental context features are stationary or stable, meaning nothing's moving. And the performer initiates the movements when they're ready. So like shooting an arrow at a stationary target, climbing a flight of stairs and so on. So nothing is moving and we can initiate the movement when we are ready. So that's self-paced or closed motor skill. Um, now the same skill could be open or closed depending on the environment. Okay, so it's not really about the skill, it's about the environment in which the skill is taking place. So just like I just described, walking across the living room where nothing else is moving versus walking across the living room where you've got a litter of puppies squirming all over the floor. It's two very different movements or two very different skills. Um, so this type of classification is used a lot in instructional methodology, rehabilitation settings, and in research literature. Um, because it is very simple, it's a really simple construct that can accommodate complex real world skills like climbing stairs or stepping onto an, an escalator, uh, but it can also be used in specific ways that make it really practical in a laboratory or a clinical setting. It also provides immediate insights into the demands of that particular skill. Um, so like balance demands, musculature, you know, the different specific demands that are required to be successful for that skill in whatever the environmental context is for that skill. Okay, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.